something that's got a paw peeking around the corner. It rocked out and back a couple of times. When it left, it was chunk, chunk, chunk. I went out to that site where it stood and stood on the same spot myself. I matched up the photograph from the trail camera with the critter and with myself and calculated the thing's height was four feet six inches tall, so up, up to my armpit. Probably six months after we set the camera, we finally remembered, oh, we need to check the camera. And there was this funny little furry something peeking out behind one of the trees. There were two pictures. That was what the camera was sent for. One was just a tree. And I looked closely at that and the second one, number 10, and number 10 showed something leaning out from behind the tree, looking at the camera. One hand on the tree, peeking out. I played them back and forth, and I realized that the first one, it had detected movement because the critter was behind the tree where there was a sapling, and it had leaned against, and the sapling had come out from behind the tree the camera caught the movement of that sapling coming out from behind a big tree and it snapped a picture. Because in the next one, the sapling's gone back behind the tree and a little varmint's right off the other side of the tree looking at us. And we sent that picture around to everybody we knew that had anything to do with animals, had anything to do with zoos. Nobody could identify what it was. One shot, the thing very obviously knew the camera was there. It was hiding behind the tree leaned out and I think I think the first shot was at 1255 and the next shot was at 101 middle of the day and it was looking right at the camera so it knew it was there this is the tree right here and you can see the sapling that's behind it that's white on the left hand side and it's pushed out away from this tree and that's what triggered the camera these branches and leaves there are attached to that small sapling when the sapling jumps back like this when the weight is taken off of it that bundle of leaves moves and the line that is white here moves back behind the larger tree bam there he is you see them right here, and the branches, I'll go back again, you see the branches that were attached to it, that sapling, pop into view, the sapling pulls back because he stopped leaning on it. I didn't want this to be a case of, I'm seeing something and it's not really there, I'm seeing something that I'm misinterpreting, so I told the computer to find edges. Here's the edge of the tree, there's the edge of the critter, you can see his round ear, you can see his eye right there. So it found that it was a thing that the computer recognized as a boundary layer. That was, that was something that was real. Here's where the creature was, right here. She's very close to it, but I wanted to get size. And here's where I found this big footprint. So here's the picture, there's the sapling, there's the tree, the sapling behind the tree, and here's where the footprint is right here. A little, zoom in a little closer and you can see, here's where the footprint is, there's the tree, and that's the sapling behind it. Now here's this rock ledge, and there is where the moss was torn off and a flap was hanging down, and you can see the footprint here into the damp leaf moss, uh, mass and I put a stick toward the back to show where the back of it was. You can see it was actually a lot more damp right down here. There's a little ledge down there underneath this this rock ledge here. There's a little area down there that would catch and hold water. So it tore the moss with the, the big toe. The foot went flop down underneath there. The heel is back here even with the heel of my own boot. So the end of the foot was up under that little ledge overhang and it made it was enough of a jerk that I think it put a lot of weight there and that caused it to be a deeper impression. 
I tried to take it with and without outline each time so that there would be a comparison you could actually see and then turn it on and turn it off. Now what I did was to measure it, this is where the heel is, the toe was right up there underneath that moss, the little fold down tab at the end of the rope, uh, the, uh, the, the line, the measuring line had folded down the little end tab that was right there, but measuring from there to the back here, it's 14 and a half inches from front to back. Neighbor called us and said, Steve, have you been out hiking in the, in the snow? And I said, no, not really. And he said, well, looked like you come hiking over onto my property. And he came over and I went out to meet him and the, the line of tracks went from where he was over at his place straight across the front of our yard, right up the middle of the yard and that way. And we figured out that it was about a quarter of a mile long all told. It was a rod straight line of prints that went right straight across the property except where it hit the driveway. And um, we've got security lights outside, uh, not security lights, security camera outside to cover where we park our cars. And it is not visually evident. People come here all the time and have no idea there's a camera out there. We get the little alert here that something's moving and we can go to the front door and, and greet them. Uh, it uses motion detection and an IR light the tracks went right to the edge of where that IR light would shine and then made a large half circle away from the light, returned to the line of travel that it had been on and continued in a straight line. So it circled around where the IR light was. At that point in 2015, I was pretty sure that the person who walked there could see the IR light. I can't see it. I don't know anybody who can. We had tracks across the front of the yard in the snow that were five feet apart in pristine snow. Uh, it got to his driveway and angled across and then all the way up to the end of the road, continued on up. We followed it until it disappeared into a big clump of trees. One of them had this odd, almost Y-shaped mark. I think it was the right foot, every one had this mark in the heel. That was a scar or a mark or an injury on the foot. The footprints were uh, 14 inches long and about four inches wide. I couldn't match the stride. I tried to match it. Um, I've got a photograph of me uh, just before I fell on my face trying to match that stride and it it just would not work i i couldn't i managed to get about four and a half feet stretched uh, my pants didn't tear but i went down before that could happen uh, you know it was a a very impressive stride and at that point we realized that this this probably was one of the folks that was howling out and back Just around midnight, there was a thump outside our bedroom window. We had gone to bed, and it was, you know, how quiet it gets when it snows. The next morning, I walked, went out, and here's this line of footprints right past the bedroom window, out, out across the yard, out to the road. So I stuck my head in and said, Steve, did you go outside this morning? He goes, no. The next morning, neither one of us had any reason to go outside until she did about midday and said, have you been outside hiking around? And I said, no, not at all. She says, well, there's a line of footprints out here right by the house. So I went out there and here's this line of prints that had come from the neighbor's yard, across our yard, right past our bedroom window, across the front and down over the, into the neighbor's driveway. 
we have a plastic box um, two-thirds the size of this love seat and it's a thing in which we store our barbecue materials barbecue is at that end of the house right outside the bedroom window now you can see it that yellow box it's there it makes a real nice hollow thump when you kick it we went out there and this line of footprints came from the neighbor's property it was a dual line of footprints came in swung in a big double arc went right beside the bedroom window right where that box is and then there was only a single line of prints and that single line of prints stretched out from five and a half to six feet step by step and headed directly across the road in a beeline uh, went onto the across the corner of the property on the other side of the street and finally turned into two sets of prints again uh, we got the yardsticks out they were six foot from one step to the next and there were two sets there was bigger prints and then there were smaller ones something that's feet were smaller than mine the prints were from the back here there's the toes right there and if you look the toes are about 14 and a half inches from the other end one of the sets of prints was smaller than the other in fact one of them was smaller than Sharon's foot we figured that was a juvenile and the other one was I think 15 and a half inches long and they came into the yard and it looked like a little kid playing there was some hop 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 you know mama was just plodding across the snow but the little kid came running closer and it looked like mama had snatched him up because you could see footprints doop doop and then it's kind of a skip like she was he was dragging his feet because mom was dragging him along we are convinced that at that point the adult male or female snatched up the juvenile and stretched out and made a beeline for distant parts it got across the road went down that drive over there and into the tree line uh 200 maybe 300 yards away 200 yards away um beeline straight straight for it and it was only until they were all the way over there and it stayed a single print and then it settled down and became two prints again uh, the juvenile walking beside the adult prints there are places in those pictures where you can see where there's like a fur on the back of the foot dragging in the snow the two tracks were about 14 feet apart as they curved and then ran along right alongside the house while they were 14 feet apart the juvenile prints went through a sequence of hop 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 on one foot dragged two sets of toes then land on the other foot and hop 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 and then drag both feet again and then hop 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 and it was in this big arc you can't do that unless you're suspended off the ground you can't drag you can hop all you want but making a six foot stretch of side by side drag marks is not possible and you can see it was barefoot I mean this is it was cold and it was the you know I, we don't figure our neighbors were walking barefoot through our yard in a snowstorm so especially not those big steps but it had been below zero overnight it did not warm up enough to thaw but these two lines of prints are a good 12 14 feet apart or more you can see the scuff just behind each one where it looked like a whisk broom had been dragged but that beeline goes straight over past that little white shed and just past the white shed is where it turned back into two prints or two sets of prints that's the little guy and you can see he's got one toe there and then here's if down here on the bottom there were prints from the other toes down in here you can see my scraggly row of footprints here compared to these big ones 
If you look closely, it's right by those trees that it thing becomes two trails again. This is turning and looking back toward the house. Those are mine, and that's the trackway. This one, you can see the toes. In this one, you can see the toes. In that one, you can see toe prints. You can see the adult trackway here with some dog scuff marks as they came through. And here's the infant or the juvenile's trackway. That's two three-foot rulers end to end. That's where they come through from the other house that way. And they come through. The juvenile swings low in the photograph. The adult swings high. The distance between here and here is about 14 feet. You swing around. Here's the barbecue sets under tarps. The two track blades come together again. And right here, with the last little double-footed slide just beyond that, now you can see it. That yellow box that's there, it makes a real nice hollow thump when you kick it. And the juvenile thumped it, and that's when the adult picked up the juvenile leaving only a single set of tracks and went scooting off in the direction of the neighbor's house across the road but the adult would have to be probably in the eight to nine foot height range easily if their arms are going to go down to their past their knees they're going to be able to reach out to one side and support junior who's doing the hop skip and drag as they make a big curve and run alongside the house. You can see back here there are three hops. There's hops right there, there's drags right there, drags right there. So this gives you approximately distance, uh, the distance apart, the location. This is the juvenile track. This is where the plastic box is, the bedroom window, and where the tracks two tracks turned into one and broke into a single stride. This is the, the path that that, whatever they were, yeah, yeah. would have to have walked that night. They yeah. came they came by yeah. your... I passed the barbecue and between the cedar tree and the steps and then out across the yard past where the chimney wasn't there now, or then like it is now. But you, there's kind of a gap in the cedars between the couple of cedar trees, and they took straight across the open part of the yard here. And at this point, the steps were six feet apart. And you could see, you know, first of all, that you, you could see bare toes. And you could also see at the back of each step that there was a little, like a brushing, like like hair was, if you had ragged blue jeans at, that drug the ground, you'd see that kind of brushing in the snow with each foot. <coughs> the other thing I noticed is when humans walk in the snow, they kind of scuff their feet, but this, these two creatures were, were very pri precise about putting their feet down. They would no, walk the way you think they yeah, would walk. Well, Humans, we kind of several feet. But this was very precise putting down. I mean, it's a different motion than we we do. They, they, I don't know if it's a difference in the way their muscles are, but you'll see the bottom of the feet. I can't even do it. <laughs> and I'll pick up a foot and you'll see the bottom before it goes further. About the property, we put a little travel trailer, park model trailer here, so we before we built. And it was one evening about dark, um, we heard a scream. It was a piercing scream which climbed in tone. This shocked us both. We sat right up, we didn't know what was that. We heard it again. It was the second time, and you could actually feel the sound. It was very, very loud. And so Steve grabbed the flashlight and shined it 
out into the grove of trees that was here where the house is now. So I went out with a really poorly powered flashlight while Sharon stood by with the phone ready to call 911 if that was necessary. The eye shine was eight feet off the ground and then when it left it was chunk chunk chunk. It wasn't the the way a deer sounds or a little something sounds. It moved behind the tree and then back out again and I realized that there was a shadow, a solid shadow going down behind the tree and it was a small tree and a large shadow. Very vague because the sun had finally dropped behind the, not only behind the trees to the west, but um, had gone down below the horizon. And so this was just a vague shadow against a dark shadowed forest scape. And it rocked out and back a couple of times. It blinked once or twice and then turned its head. And I heard six large crunches and the thing moved lightning fast. Six big heavy steps. I could feel the ground tremor like when a truck goes by. And the six steps and it was gone. We were at this nice dark corridor out of the forest coming through. What has orange eyes stands seven and a half to eight feet tall and sounds like an elephant running through the woods. And one of the guys said, you've seen the booger. I had sent a note to BFRO at that time about the 1998 incident with the howling. And it was right at that time when we got a phone call from Ron Bowles who said, uh, I'd like to come out and talk with you about this. When we first started hearing them, we called BFRO. And Ron Bowles came down, this was our first meeting with him, and he and Steve went down in the woods just to see if they could see anything. See if there's tracks, see if there's tree structures, hear anything. And so they walked down quite a ways. I don't know how far I didn't go. And we went down in the forest and looked around. He found a number of different sized footprints that were scuffed into the, uh, the loam where the, the, the leaves were depressed, the things were kicked. They were very clear footprints but they weren't castable because they, they were just displacement of leaves. But they were various sizes. I did find a good uh, print or two in the bottom of that drop-off is where I found the footprints. Memory serves, the footprint was, oh, I want to say somewhere around 16 inches long. And it was pretty deep, I mean, you know, for the terrain of the Ozarks. You know, it was, uh, I mean, with me to put all my, my weight on, on the ground, I mean, I could barely make a dent, and this footprint was a good half an inch deep. And he said, I honestly think that you've got a family group frequenting this lower portion of your property. At that time, he said he'd really like to try a call, uh, a holler to see if he can get a response. And he tried three times. I didn't hear anything, but I have hearing loss uh, due to audio trauma in the military. And uh, we came back up, talked with Sharon for a while, and he headed off. At the time, my sister was living in our travel trailer, and uh, we had the house here by then. So they came back up, and it was about sunset, Ron, Ron and all of us, well, the three of us talked, and then he left. That was the trigger for the next event, which was my sister-in-law was living in the little trailer where we had stayed before we built our home. And when we came back up out of the forest, because there's no paths down there except deer trails, then we came up right behind the trailer. And 
the next night when my sister came in from from work she looked just worn out and I said why'd you have a hard day she goes no I didn't sleep last night she said something came up out of the woods and slammed on the trailer and roared scared the cat and I and we didn't sleep the rest of the night something apparently had come up after us that night and walloped the side of the trailer and roared and it just scared the you know what out of her and her cat and she went off to work at the crack of dawn the next morning so we didn't know about it we did not hear it uh, she came home that evening and she just looked like 10 miles of really rough road and we said something to her about it and she said she just hadn't slept because this thing had slapped whatever it was it slapped the trailer and roared uh, and Ron had done some tree knocks and some calls down there. So I, we assumed that they, somebody followed the guys back up the hill and was reestablishing the fact that that was his woods and he didn't appreciate somebody hollering in his woods. But. Well, I went out and looked. There was no damage to the trailer. Um, but what she accounted, recounted to us was alarming enough we immediately called Ron Bowles, and he apologized profusely, said, I'm sorry, I probably should have told you that might happen. And the next morning, I received a phone call from Steve. At that time, Steve's sister-in-law used to live in a little cabin out there where they built their house. Somewhere in the course of the night, something came up behind that house that night, thumped on the wall, and let out a big yell. It's obvious that there's some, at least one, probably a bunch down here on the property that um, are at least part-time using that portion down by the water and don't want to be interrupted. And so, as I said, he was, he was very profuse in his apologies. Um, and he's been out numerous times since then to try and catch recordings of their calls in the night. We got a um, bloodhound that was a house dog for the most part. And we, I would walk her every night right before bedtime, one last walkies down to the woods. And one night I stepped out, it was probably October, September, October, it was just a little cool. And we walked around the corner of the house. And as I walked, as we went around the corner, there was a sound straight down behind us here. And it was a huge sound. I mean, it, I'm, I'm a singer. But, you know, and so here's this thing down in the woods holding this note. And it, it almost was like a tunnel of sound. It was one note, there was no up and down. It was huge, and it was a ooh, and it went long. It, you know, I could, at the time, I could hold a note for about 12, 14 counts. This thing was a good 16, 18 counts, and it was huge, and it was one note. Not a coyote, not a, you know, no waivers. Sharon coming hustling into the house at about probably a half an hour after sunset, dragging the dog saying, you gotta come outside and hear this. And we went outside and she had heard a call that just set her back on her heels. And this call was echoing out of the, um, the valley behind our house. Um, our property is 10 acres and it goes back on one side about a thousand feet and the other side about 980 feet from the road all the way back to the creek which is the boundary line of the property and so I can run drag the dog back in and, and said Steve you know you got to come out here and hear what's going on because it had started again by the time I got in this was from way down in that valley down near the creek but it was probably one of the most powerful sounds I'd ever heard it it came from a set of lungs that was as big as three men it was huge 
it it resonated and it was a pure sound it was a solid tone and it the dog didn't like it she whined and paced around a little bit but on a leash she wasn't going far but anyway that was this call and that basically started a sequence which lasted for about four years where we had four or five times a week we had calls which were coming out of the valley behind the house we started hearing things at night sometimes we would hear something up the draw up the hollow calling sometimes we'd hear something up the draw calling and then down a little bit there's another one answering back and forth sometimes there was three sometimes there was four it's like they were hunting they were driving something to maybe a guy with down here on the bottom with the club i don't know two three sometimes very rarely four voices calling back and forth from different locations uh, and they were distinct we could tell the different voices uh, there were slight differences in tone they used a a sequence of sounds which weren't just a call like a dog howling um, there was inflection we go up at the end or down at the end of a statement or a question kind of and if you put it in terms of, of human speech um, they had long medium and short tones but it was it was obvious there were multiple voices we got to where we could pick out the sounds of well there's old quaver there's there's that uh, you know they, they, we kind of had nicknames for the different sounds um, didn't make any difference what the weather was sometimes it was pouring down rain and they'd be out there hollering um, sometimes in a snowstorm it was almost like uh, a sequence of code uh, wasn't Morse code but it was that sort of thing longer notes shorter notes moderately length notes uh, inflection rising inflection falling in the middle of this sequence and at the very end there would be a drop or a rise or a steady tone there was one that sounded like a little kid that was lost I mean, sounded like them, but it was this little guy down in the woods just calling and calling and calling. It was very obvious they were calling back and forth. All of them were like, whoo, whoo, whoo. There were inflections, like people talking have inflections. Um, but they were, a lot of them had that big long power behind them. They really carried. It didn't make any difference if it was a driving rainstorm. If they were down there yelling, you could hear them. You could hear them here in the house. It was pouring rain. And this thing started howling right inside the tree line. And I could see brush moving. But I couldn't see what was moving it. Um, I turned on a recorder. I pointed a microphone at it. Um, I had, it was a uh, parabolic antenna and and pointed at it and was trying to get it I managed to record about 40 seconds before a drop of rain hit the thing and a big buzz started you know it just completely shorted it out 622 in the evening on 4 February And that's whenever the buzzer went yep, up. Yep, that's when the know. water hit my electronics and it went. Bleh. One summer, our peach tree finally just decided it was going to put out fruit, and it was a huge amount of fruit. We had props under all the branches. It was like a 15 foot tall peach tree out here at the side of the house. And we'd kind of been putting off, you know, watching it, wait, waiting for it to be ready to start picking all, all that fruit. 
and the squirrels were kind of getting into it. But we looked at it one day and said, okay, tomorrow's the day we're going to get the basket out. Overnight, everything was gone. Top to bottom, underneath the tree, not a peach, not a peach pit, not a rotten piece of skin. The, something had come in and stripped that tree, picked up everything underneath the tree. And in addition, we had um, pie pans on strings, you know, like people keep birds away from the fruit. They had taken the pie pans and wrapped them around the branches so they wouldn't clank. And some of the fruit was 15 feet high. So um, we kind of thought, well, they saw that we weren't eating the fruit, so they figured it shouldn't go to waste. So that was really the only thing that ever they ever came in and actually bothered anything that was ours. So the peach tree was right in this vicinity. Yeah, and it was it was several years old, and it was absolutely loaded with fruit. We had uh, props under the heavier branches so it wouldn't break, and the tallest was probably 15 feet tall, and it was just loaded. The I have no idea how much fruit was on it, but the squirrels had started getting into it, and so there was stuff where the squirrels would take one bite and drop it on the ground. But we were about ready to pick, and the next morning we came out here, and there was nothing. There was not a single peach. Not on the ground, not on the trees, not on the tallest branches. And the crazy thing was, is the pie plates on the string that we had put there to keep maybe scare the birds away, which didn't work. Uh, they had taken those pie plates and wound them around the branches as tight as it would go so that they wouldn't clank when the branches moved. But then a tremendous cleanup job. Dead stuff, rotten stuff, the whole thing around the ground was absolutely <laughs> like I had been raked up. He called me that very morning. Oh, he was fit to be tied. He was ready to do the harvest and he comes out there and not one single peach was left on the tree. Not one single peach was laying on the ground. It's like someone came in there and picked every one of them and took off with them. We found a tree that had been pushed over and it fell east to west, which is contrary to all prevailing winds in the area. It had fallen completely over the entire root ball had come up. Um, there were impressions on the tree trunk that seemed to indicate that it had been grabbed or, or manhandled in some way. And this, this tree was in the 8 inch diameter uh, range. The leaves, when we found them, were wilting and almost all had turned from green but just barely they were still very pliable sticks and branches from trees all around had been piled onto the foliage of the down tree there had not been any storms any wind at all during that period of time and this was on a level piece of ground it was not on any kind of a slope the the slope runs basically downhill to the north and slightly, slightly to the east. As the slope went down, the tree fell like this. It didn't fall downhill. It didn't fall uphill. It fell from east to west across the, the, the slope. So there was no gravity impetus for it to have happened. There was no wind. There was no excessive rain that would have weakened the soil and this thing had, you know, a branch or something hanging out. It, it wasn't overbalanced. The whole thing was just laying down with this massive root ball wad sticking up with the roots hanging out of it. And then branches from all the trees around evergreen branches, uh, deciduous trees, all piled on top of the foliage and it formed a shelter. And we went downhill and looked in it and there was a massive pile of leaves that had been pushed in there, scooped up. There were leaves falling everywhere, it's, it's untouched forest, but it was very obvious that they'd been scooped up and pushed in there and there was a very big 
pattern that indicated something had been reclining in there. Not just sitting down, but reclining. It, there was either that or several somethings had been sitting in there. It was fairly close to the creek at the bottom of the hill. It looked like this one had been created. It wasn't done by a man. There's the big big prints, 16, 16 and a quarter, 16 and a half inches. Him showing where the markers are for the width and all that. Again, the, the pictures don't do it justice. This is under the tree. There's the tree that was pushed over. And all the other branches that have been piled onto it, you can see some of them back here. There's this one right here, and you know, all of the stuff that had been piled under, and then it was packed down, something had been lying underneath it. We also found two large X's, big logs that were laid out on the ground in X's. And we found uh, a double or triple tree growing out of a single root, and branches from trees in the entire vicinity were stacked through the intersection of the where the stems of or the trunks of those small tree pieces came together. They were all in there. It was a big starburst. Um, nothing close. Nothing could have fallen in there by chance because the tree that grew out of these three stems kept the, it was a protection that covered over, nothing could have fallen, and most of the branches came from trees that were well away from the location we found them. This is tree that's got November 3rd. You can see there are sticks all through there. Here's a, a different shot. Branches from a number of different trees jammed in there to make a big starburst, I guess, if you look down on top of it. Trying to see it from several angles. That's probably the best one. And none of those came from trees immediately around it. The only thing we could figure is they came from trees that were further out. They'd been put down there and set this way, that way, the other way, set it so that they were just where they needed to be. There's Big X that we found. Oh, that's, a, that's the tree again. There's one Big X and there's another one. We found one odd branch. It was bent at an angle about like that. I like my finger and thumb. And it was balanced on a branch for a sapling. And it was swinging in the breeze. There was no tree for that branch to have come from. That thing had to have been picked up and put there on purpose. And it was perfectly balanced. It swung in the wind. We touched it. It swung freely. It didn't fall off. There was a little knot on the underside where it hung on a sapling to keep it from falling. Just perfect to do that. And it it was standing in an isolated spot that, that was almost open to the sky. There was nothing that could have happened naturally. Somebody or something put that there and it's last I knew it was still there. Here's that weird balanced stick. This thing does not have, it, it, there's, there's a little bitty knot or something right there that's holding it perfectly. It just sits there and moves. It's actually suspended above the floor of the forest. It's hanging there. That was physically placed there, no question is a small branch, it's called Houseman Branch, that, that runs into Swan Creek. 
and it's we're at an elevation of about 960 feet here. By the time you get down to the branch, it's about 700. So there's a good drop off. Um, it's just rock layer after rock layer, um, bare, just plain old woods with cedars and oaks and so nothing. There's no buildings down there. It's just woods. There was a driving snowstorm. We heard a younger voice. It was higher in pitch. It was juvenile sounding. We both thought, my goodness, the thing's lost in the snow and it's calling for mom. And it called and called and we ultimately decided that as long as we're standing outside on the back porch listening, nobody was going to move. Nobody's going to answer. Nobody's going to call. We came in. It, it ended very shortly after that and we can only presume that Mom showed up and claimed the youngin. Three or four times a week, sometimes nightly. Then sometimes it would be that we'd have a gap. There'd, there'd be a week or ten days and we'd not hear anything. Um, we kept track. We put, wrote, always wrote on the calendar what time we heard it, what the weather was. And it didn't seem to correspond with the phase of the moon or the weather or anything. It was just like maybe they were here hunting and then maybe they had to go somewhere else to hunt for a week. But it went on for several years. Sometimes I'd be out in the garden and there they were. So they weren't totally nocturnal. It was more at night than it was in the daytime. But every now and then there'd be somebody down there in the middle of the day, broad you know, sunlight. I don't know, it, it, that was the thing. It was so, so random. It wasn't like you could set your clock to it uh, or, or it's the full moon, they're gonna howl. We were recording calls on many occasions. I listen to sound files. Um, Cornell University has a great sound lab. I'd listen to every owl on the face of the earth. Um, the, the closest I could come was this little saw wet owl that was out in the rainforest out, out in, you know, something about this big. Uh, the call would go on and if the call went on too long, the dogs would just get real brave and pipe in. Some of them well, some of them were a deeper, you know, you hear two people talking and you don't understand their language. And um, just difference in pitch, difference in uh, the strength of the voice. Um, they were, they were it, it was like they were all speaking the same language and it, it wasn't like we were hearing the, the Sierra sounds, uh, which we didn't know about at the time. <laughs> but, uh, but it was just a series of howls and calls um, it felt like they were communicating with each other to some degree. It's just a language we didn't speak. 9.17 in the evening on 15 December 2009. I'll put this on the back porch. some voices that you know you'd have one that was uh, uh, south of their property and then some that was north of their property responding so that tells me that that there's probably more than one that was hanging around in that area do they hang around that area you know year round no i don't think so i don't think they even hang around there during the uh, you know every year i think they they might, you know, not so much as migrate, they just move around a lot. You know, where the food and water is good, that's where they go. When it, when the uh, food starts to uh, dissipate, they move on to greener, greener pastures, if you will. We did not know whether we had something different, the Ozark Howler, or we had a very distinct Missouri version of Sasquatch.
2011 is when this show was to be filmed and in October of on October 14th it was a Friday the folks from the television production company uh, showed up at about midday the Sun went down the moon had not come up and they realized how dark the Ozarks really was and so I suggested they work in the edge of the yard the edge of the forest they they were fine with that we built a fire for them and they began filming reenactments we built a fire for them and a couple of the guys were reenacting their encounter and the director rather than saying action decided that he was going to howl and that way if the howl was showed up in the film it wasn't kind of out of character and so he got behind one of the big trees at the bottom of the yard and he would howl and then they would the cameras would roll so they did this over and over and over again the director instead of saying the word action with each one of these different reenactments that they were filming told everyone that he was going to howl. He'd heard the recordings that we had and he was going to use that howl as the signal for action because if it was picked up on their sound recorders and they somehow wound up having to use video that had that particular sound attached to it, it would not be a problem because the howl would work with what they were doing. So from just after sundown until 10 o'clock, this guy was howling like a fiend back there in the, in the tree line. The camera was with him, looking around trees so that the viewers, when they saw this, would get the creature's eye view, point of view, looking out from behind trees at people in their various situations. They left about 10.30, that was when the last car rolled out. About 12.30, the big guy shows up and he's really aggravated. They left at 10.30 and we went to bed. And at 12.30, we both woke up to this tremendous yelling noise coming from the tree line. It was the singular voice that we had come to call Old Quaver and he was highly agitated. He was pissed off and he was howling. He was stomping back and forth. We couldn't see him because the moon had just started to rise. It was still almost completely behind the trees to the east but there was enough light but the yard had some light to it. The tree line was still pitch dark. Um, you can see along the edge here where there, there's an obvious line of, looks like it's been bowed. Now there's leaves all over it. But down below that was that kind of semi-cleared area. And that's where he was walking when he got so ups when the guy got so upset about the producer howling at him. He was walking along just right along that drop off right below that back and forth aimed at you know the calls were aimed at the house obviously but it was just a little brushy and pitch dark so we never did actually see him but boy he was loud but we could hear rocks clattering we could hear branches he was stomping back and forth kicking things breaking trees breaking branches breaking it sounded like he was carving a path through the forest he's yelling he's breaking trees he's roaring he's you could hear him pacing right at the bottom of the yard right where the tree line ends and our mowed yard began and he's back and forth you could you could feel the um anger or the aggression this wasn't just, oh, I'm out here hunting. This is, no, you guys stepped over the line. You let somebody here roar. This is, you know, it was like we had an agreement. <laughs> and he was reestablishing the fact that that part of the woods was still his. And he paced back and forth. He broke trees. Um, he threw things for 45 minutes. The film crew left just shortly ago and hours outside.
itself. You see why we call them quaver? Two of them. That's mine. This is the Okay. I don't know how big he was. I don't know how much he may have done. We had not touched the forest, so there was a lot of, uh, there were fallen branches and things like that that we left in place for, for nature. Um, we wanted it to be absolutely natural. And so he was stomping, he was throwing, he was kicking. I responded by going out the back door with a 12 gauge shotgun and standing on the porch in full view. I looked for him, I couldn't see him. Um, ultimately, he, he was going for about 45 minutes and close to the end of it. I mean, I recorded the first 15 minutes of it, but um, and Sharon stood behind me with a secondary weapon. If, you know, if I ran out of bullets and went down, she could at least do something. But he never charged the house. I fully expected it, a, a rush to the house. I fully expected a, a charge of some kind. And when that didn't happen immediately, it, it really occurred to me that we were being um, corrected or remonstrated for, uh, uh, for, for having transgressed. And uh, so I actually called out, it wasn't us. It was the guy with the film crew. They're gone. They won't be back. We understand. Stop. It, we aren't, it's not us. They're gone. You could hear the crunch of the tree breakings. You could hear things thumping, I guess, hitting the trees down there below. Because it was pitch dark. It, the, the moon had just, I think the moon didn't rise until like one o'clock or something like that. It, they, when they filmed, it was dark. So um, we, we never saw him. He stayed below. And at that point, we really didn't want to see him because he was pretty scary. You know, we had, we had a gun waiting for him if he decided to get closer. Very shortly after that, he continued to yell, but he turned around and he yelled as he walked down the hill. And... Uh, we went back to bed. Sharon managed to get to sleep. I didn't. I had the shotgun right next to the bed. I was ready all night long to jump up and because I didn't know if I'd convince him to go away or if it was, a, you know, he was going to come back for more. Right below the edge of the yard, there's undergrowth. Um, three, four inch diameter cedars and you know, just odds and ends of whatever grows in Missouri. And he was breaking them off about six feet off the ground uh, and they were broken in a line so that each bend kind of formed a, a fence like this is yours this is mine it was it, it felt like he was reestablishing the ground rules for sharing the property the next morning i called a friend who lives up near kansas city who is a a contributing member and investigator for the Mid-America Bigfoot Research Council, MABRC. I told him what had happened and I said, I've got a camera ready to go. I'm not going to go in the woods until you get here. Bring a camera. We will go down in the forest together so that neither one of us is going to have the advance of the other. We will see the same things at the same time and I'll wait for you. And he and his wife took four hours. They got here just after midday and we headed down into the forest. We found four trees broken over at six feet off the ground or just a little bit above six feet off the ground. 
They were uh, three inches diameter, something about like that. Uh, one of them was a little bit smaller, and it turned out that that was a rotten, a rotten cedar. It had been broken, but pulled out of the ground, and so it was laying there broken, but it had been yerked out of the ground. The, the roots and everything came up with it. Uh, one of them was a cedar, one of them was a birch, and the one that we found first was an oak. It would, they were all fresh breaks broken over and left at uh, roughly a 90 degree angle. The, the broken part was sort of horizontal to the ground. And if you stood at the end of the line and you looked along it, it made a real nice, very visual graphic fence. Here's all these barriers. And it was very, very evident to both of us that the message was, you stay on your side, don't come on this side. Uh, here's the next day when we went down. You can see the tree broken off there. There's the other one. Hand grip here and there's a second hand grip there. Breaking it off that was six feet above the ground. Um, let me see. Here's the here's one. I didn't get the birch. Here's this one that was broken off and it was uprooted. So we recorded 20, 25 minutes of him being aggravated before we figured he's not going to come to the house. Um, and we finally, when he stopped, we went back to bed. And but but that was he was, he was throwing a fit. I think it was the the guy in charge. I'm I'm assuming that they kind of have a a clan with. Um, a big guy in charge and then the rest of the family. Uh, again, we didn't know at the time, but it was just one voice and he was not happy. We'll stay on this side. We don't come up there and bother you. Uh, I didn't see a sign that said stop howling, but I presume that the night before the little visit was the stop howling message. I think that based on the two sets of tracks that we'd had, and the howls associated with something that was stomping and breaking trees. Um, that to me was something that was standing on two feet. It had two hands free to break trees. Uh, and that's not going to be the Ozark Howler, which was typically described as a bear-sized cat with horns and covered with black shaggy fur. So I said, I think what you really need to consider is that this is, this is bipedal. It's a mixture of um, folklore stories and actual interaction with a, a Bigfoot Sasquatch uh, creature. We investigated a, uh, a sighting that was next door to to the Robinsons. During the investigation, Steve didn't know about it, and the neighbor didn't know about it. We decided not to tell either one, but I was familiar with the area, if you will. Just down the road from them, uh, another family was having occurrences there, but she actually saw one just outside of their property line. She was out there off the back porch uh, smoking a cigarette, and she saw this, you know, large figure poke his head out of the woods. I said, now, I'm six foot three. Is that about high as it was? She said, no, it was taller. And I took my hat off, and I extended the hat all the way as high as my arm could go, which is about eight feet. I said, how about there? And she goes, yeah, that will do it. They were in the valley on that side of the road. They were uh, more in the daytime than the others had been. They were during the night, but they were also very, very daylight calls. We stopped hearing them back behind us. And then there was kind of a quiet spell. And then we started hearing something across the street. We still hear it. I heard it yesterday. Mm -hmm.